And uh, yeah, first of all, I want to give you a little bit of a background for those of you who haven't participated in our webinars before um, about what we're all about. Wheel and Anchor is about bringing travelers together. So our idea is, is that we have created a community of, uh, of sort of like-minded people who are already well-traveled uh, and who are interested in uh, meeting other people who aspire to something that is a little bit more than the usual kind of tour package that you find and, uh, and, and just getting to know, making friends. And that's really how this all started was um, with a whole bunch of people who had already traveled together and were already friends. And now we're just expanding that circle through Wheel and Anchor. So that's what our mission here is um, and our vision, my vision for you is uh, uh, is and for all of the members at Wheel and Anchor is about becoming well traveled. And you know, when you are well traveled, you you have uh, you, you gain the opportunity to learn something about other people's cultures, traditions. Um, you know, you sample what what life is like in other parts of the world. And I think it's um, it's probably one of the most enriching, enriching things we can do as human beings. Um, but at the same time, to be well-connected, connected not only to other travelers, other Canadians uh, who, who, who like to travel, but also affording the opportunity to be, become connected to people in these, in these other countries who we visit along the way. Um, and often those will result in lasting memories. So the team here that's on our webinar today um, consists of myself, Gordon. I'm the founder of Wheel and Anchor. Um, um, uh, also with me is Joel Curry, who is my co-founder and is providing our technical support this morning, and Cassandra McKen McKennon, who is our senior member services specialist. And if you pick up the phone and you dial our office, she's the one who um, will likely be picking up the phone um, and dealing with the, the inquiries and bookings and so on. So we're um, all very proud to be with you this morning. The plan for today, um, really, it's about you. Um, and again, this is the focus of Wheel and Anchor. You, as a traveler, you're curious about what this part of the Middle East is all about. Um, it seems to be in the news all the time, um, not to mention, of course, the, the ancient civilization that comprise this reason. And, and my job here is as your guide, is to, to guide you through this, uh, the webinar today, then, of course, on the tour itself. Um, as an explorer with open eyes um, to learn about what this amazing part of the world is all about. And our destination, of course, of course Egypt, Israel, and Jordan, which is what we're going to be inquiring into um, over the next 30 to 40 minutes. Um, so let's get started um, uh, with a little bit of an overview of the region. And I have a, um, a map here um, that, that shows, this is a Google map, obviously, that shows the, the, the area that we're talking about. Um, really the heart of the Middle East, um, you know, the, the pyramids of Egypt, the Nile Valley, um, you know, and of course the holy lands of, uh, of Israel, Jordan, Palestine. Um, there's, uh, there's so much in this region. I mean, this is the cradle of civilization. They have uh, found evidence of humankind here back to the 10th century um, BC. So when you explore this region, it truly is like, like walking through um, history. Uh, because we'll be amongst uh, ruins, amongst the pyramids and the temples in Egypt that are thousands and thousands of years old, um, to much more recent history, around the time of Christ, of course, in Israel and Bethlehem, um, where Christ was born, and uh, and uh, then also seeing these incredible um, tombs um, in Jordan. Uh, so, so this is uh, what this region is all about. It's a unique part of the world, and I think it's something that must be on everybody's list. Taking a little closer look at the map of where our program is going to go, um, as I mentioned in the title, this is this program has four different variations, um, which kind of makes it kind of neat because then you can um, our members can pick and choose what aspect of the region that they want to visit. Program A will consist of Egypt only. It will consist uh, of our of our tour starting in Cairo uh, and then doing uh, our Nile cruise. Uh, on, the, uh, on the part of the Nile between Luxor and Aswan, um, as well as um, a few nights in Cairo itself, visiting the pyramids and the, the Grand Egyptian Museum. Uh, and then um, one can do just Egypt in and of itself, or you can continue on. We'll fly then for those who will do Program B to Israel, which will take in, uh, which will commence in Tel Aviv. Uh, and it will, then we'll visit, of course, Jerusalem will be the highlight. Um, and then the third option, Program C, is to do all three countries. So we'll do Egypt, Israel, and we'll continue overland from Israel into Jordan uh, and spend a week there uh, between Amman, Petra, and the Dead Sea. 
Uh, and then, of course, you have the option to not do Egypt. Um, for those that perhaps have already been to, you can do just Israel and Jordan. So that's how it works. So you can join us for any piece. So we we'll may have people coming and going throughout, which will make it a little bit interesting. So let's now dive into the day-by-day -day itinerary, and I'll explain a little bit about what we can expect uh, along the way. So our, the, the trip begins on January the 14th, when we'll head out of Canada on our overnight flight uh, to, it will take us first of all to Europe, likely to Frankfurt, uh, and then it'll continue on to Cairo after a short layover, where we'll arrive um, in the late afternoon. And uh, I've decided to set it up this way such that we're going to spend the first evening right at Cairo Airport. There's a wonderful Meridian Hotel that's attached to the airport terminal. Um, so there'll be a few hours of, of leisure time in the afternoon when we arrive. For those that are adventurous, we can head into this busy, chaotic city. I mean, you'll know that Cairo is one of the largest cities in Africa and in the Middle East. There's over 9 million people and it's sprawling and it's bustling and the traffic is chaotic and it has an air to it that is you know, Cairo is simply Cairo, one of the world's great cities for um, many different reasons. So, um, as I say, we'll just have a few hours here at the end of the day, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll enjoy a, a quiet evening uh, to before we begin then our tour. By staying here in Cairo uh, the first day or, or staying at the night, this also affords those that wish to come in on other areas, other ones that we than the ones that we suggest. Um, it's then very easy because you can literally just pop over to the airport. So we'll all gather together um, and then continue out the next day where we will fly on our domestic flight after breakfast. Uh, we'll go to, we'll fly down to Luxor um, where we will um, head more or less directly for our ship, the, the Sunray. And Luxor will have a bit of time when we embark the ship. So this is the, obviously the starting and the ending point of our uh, seven night Nile cruise. Uh, and, you know, Luxor is, is I, I think, um, the, one of the predominant destinations for people who are interested in um, Egyptian history. Um, they called it the city of a hundred doors, um, largely because of the large doors that adorn many of the temples. Um, and, uh, and, and there are so many um, archaeological sites and so on, uh, temples and so on uh, to visit. We'll be seeing the most important ones while we're here in Luxor, but our first afternoon will afford us a little bit of time um, to be able to, to wander around uh, the city itself. We'll, we'll obviously be moored here uh, near the city center um, on the Nile. Um, and uh, our ship is going to be our home for the next seven days. This is the MS Sunray. She's part of the Movenpick group of um, hotels and resorts. Uh, and she's a wonderful five-star ship. She's really one of the best that is cruising on the Nile. Um, she is. Uh, she has uh, 66 cabins spread over um, three decks. Um, there, there is. Uh, it's, it's quite opulent inside. Um, there is a, uh, a swimming pool on the roof that you can enjoy, uh, and uh, on obviously a large. Uh, dining room where our meals will be taken uh, each day. They have uh, buffet-style meals uh, for all three meals, which is quite convenient because they offer quite a, a, an array of both Western food and more local Egyptian food. So that way you really get to pick and choose. It's 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 really terrific. It's a five-star experience. Um, the cabins on board, um, very comfortable. All of the standard cabins are about 20 square meters inside, a little over 200 square feet. Um, you here get a a sense of what they what they look like. Obviously, everything air conditioned, um, private washrooms. It's all um, first class quality um, on this ship. Cruising down the Nile this way is really a sublime experience. Uh, I have not done it myself, but for the many people, colleagues, and friends, um, they say that it's uh, it's just amazing because, of course, the Nile is a beltway of green cutting through the desert. So, um, irrespective of all the wonderful sights. That we'll see along the way, um, just enjoying uh, the ship uh, and uh, the the sights, the contrast between the green banks of the Nile and the the um, obviously arid yellow desert behind it. That, that in and of itself is is quite an experience. Um, there's uh, only 66 cabins on this ship, so about 130 um, passengers. Uh, and uh, you, as I said, you have uh, the standard cabins are really quite excellent. That's the ones we have included in the program. Um, they do have a, a few suites on board as well for those who uh, prefer a little bit more space. 
um, with separate living areas and so on. So um, the Sunray will be a, a great place for us to um, explore um, Egypt, the each most ancient civilizations in Egypt as we cruise down the Nile. And our first day on January the 17th, um, we'll be still moored in Luxor. The Valley of the Kings is on the opposite bank from the city of Luxor itself. Uh, and here uh, is, is probably the most significant uh, archaeological site in Egyptian history, um, the burial ground of the pharaohs, the most notable of which um, King Tutankhamun, um, whose, whose remains were found here. Um, most of the 63 tombs that are in this valley are not even open to the public. Um, needless to say, they are under our archaeological protection. Um, but we'll head out early in the morning um, just to uh, avoid the, the heat of midday um, so that we can explore um, some, of these, uh, some of these valleys, some of these temples, um, before we then return in the afternoon back to the ship um, and then continue our voyage um, upstream up the Nile as we head then towards um, Edfu. So um, our average day, we'll spend part of the day uh, touring, uh, touring these sites and then part of the day relaxing on board ship as we make our way to our next destination. The following day, we'll be at Edfu, um, known for the Temple of Horus, which is one of the best preserved of all of the Egyptian monuments. Um, and you get a little bit of a sense um, from this image that we've taken that, you know, the, the, uh, the drawings, the, the etchings uh, in the rocks, um, so well done. You, you can spend hours um, uh, admiring the, the, the workmanship here that has been so, so well preserved. Um, so this is a game where we'll spend the morning and the afternoon will be a great time to have afternoon tea served in the classic style um, on board the ship. Um, and uh, part of the part of the activities on board the ship is they have a number of entertainment evenings, and this will be the first of which um, this area is known as Galabia, and the Galabian people um, uh, are known for a specific style of uh, of dress. So you'll be encouraged by uh, by myself as well as by the our crew on the ship to um, um, get uh, some a Galabian outfit. To participate in the evening and so you can you can buy them on board the ship although my recommendation is uh, is to find something at one of the bazaars that will pass after we visit Edfu um, so that you can participate in the festivities. Um, we'll then sail down the next day uh, and arrive at Aswan. Um, of course Aswan is is famous for the high dam that uh, was built there. I mean it's a piece of history in and of itself um, and this is where um, the, the, uh, the cruise sort of is the turnaround point. Um, ships like ours cannot uh, travel through the locks further. Well, they could, but they generally don't. This is the stopping point. Uh, and the Aswan Dam, of course, uh, was, it was a, a very controversial project for many, many reasons. Um, it was uh, constructed because it was necessary uh, to control the flooding of the Nile um, further downriver. They had huge problems. Um, in the early part of the 20th century. They built this massive, massive dam. It's something like four kilometers wide uh, and uh, uh, um, four, four kilometers uh, yeah, in width and a kilometer in, in, in thickness. Uh, and it uh, holds back Lake Nasser, which is one of the largest um, archeological, or sorry, one of the largest reservoirs in the world. It's something like 500 kilometers now. The, the lake stretches all the way south in, into the Sudan. So we'll will admire this uh, engineering project itself. Um, it was financed, of course, by, well, I shouldn't say of course, it was, it was very controversial when they finally got around to building it uh, in the 60s. Um, the Americans had wanted to finance it, but uh, the war started between Israel and Egypt. Uh, and uh, so they were sort of kicked out and the Russians were the one that ended up financing this, this project. Obviously, it's a hydroelectric. It wasn't originally uh, envisioned that way, but of course, it is an important hydroelectric power project, um, and it supplies um, it supplies uh, about half of the electricity in, in Egypt. So, quite a quite a site in and of itself. But of course, Aswan is is more known for the archaeological sites that are around it. And we'll we'll visit, for example, the unfinished obelisk. Uh, as well as the Philae Temple, uh, as we spend our, our day here um, uh, seeing the sights of Aswan. Um, we'll also get a chance to go for a ride on a Faluka, which is that uh, sort of sailboat that you see in the, in the image uh, on the bottom. And that will be our, 
our day touring as one. The following day on the 20th of January, um, we'll then have a free day, essentially. Um, on this day, we'll be offering an optional trip down to Abu Simbel, um, which is not... Um, um, the reason we made it optional is, is that the temples at Abu Simbel that uh, you can see here in the image um, were actually relocated from uh, around the uh, around the Aswan Dam area because they would have been otherwise flooded. In fact, there was a great number of monuments um, that are that would have been uh, flooded and that the Egyptian government had to relocate. And these incredible um, statues of uh, Ramses uh, that we'll find at Abu Simbel um, are are really quite spectacular. Um, and so for for many people, it's worth taking this side trip um, where we would fly down in the morning and get a private guided tour of uh, Abu Simbel itself and learn a little bit about not only the history of these statues, but the, the whole relocation project, which was an engineering feat um, in and of itself back in 1970 when they did this. Um, and so that is, that'll be our optional trip to Abu Simbel. Of course, there's lots to do uh, in Aswan itself. So by no means is it, uh, is it necessary to go there um, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see who goes, uh, who decides to, to go down. I, th I think it's probably a very worthwhile little, little add on to the trip. Um, so after our, our day in Aswan uh, or Abu Simbel, for those that choose, we'll then, um, head to Komombo. Um, and so Komombo, um, is interesting because it's a double temple. Uh, and, uh, it's, uh, it's, well, I think one of the most exciting things, what I'm looking forward to seeing inside is these, uh, the crocodile mummies. They have something like 30 um, mummified uh, crocodile remains amongst all of the other um, the, um, uh, mummies and, and uh, Egyptian artifacts that we'll find there. But it's always, I think, a highlight for people from, um, from the stories that I heard. So we'll, we'll enjoy part of our day in Komombo. Um, and uh, again, that evening we'll, we'll, probably have a Nubian show, which is where the, um, uh, the local Nubians, these were the, the, the uh, essentially like the native population, a lot of whom were relocated when they had to construct the Aswan Dam. Um, and uh, we'll uh, get a little bit of insight into their culture and history um, in an evening of entertainment by the Nubians. Um, then the following day, our ship will make its way back again downstream, um, back towards Luxor. Uh, and then we'll visit the, um, the West Bank um, and have a chance to visit the actual Luxor and Karnak temples, which are, um, excuse me, they're on the East Bank. The Valley of the Kings is on the West Bank and these are on the, um, the East Bank. Uh, and uh, once again, some of the most important um, um, archaeological sites in Egyptian history. Um, and that's where we will spend our last day on the ship back in Luxor. Probably a good chance to hit up some of the bazaars there. Um, they have some amazing hand, handcrafts, great, great things to bring back home as our memory of traveling in this area. So after our seven nights on the ship, then we'll, we'll check out on the 23rd of January um, and uh, fly back up in the late morning um, back to Cairo, um, where we'll then um, check into our hotel. Um, I'm very excited that I've been able to secure space at the Four Seasons Hotel. Um, Four Seasons, obviously, one of the um, leading hotel uh, brands in the world. Uh, and this uh, Four Seasons First Residence Hotel located right on the Nile is, um, is certainly one of their most wonderful properties. Uh, and it'd be a wonderful, a terrific place to spend three nights from where we can um, explore Cairo. Uh, again, we'll have a little bit of time for relaxation in the afternoon just to take in this, this glorious hotel with its views up and down the Nile um, or to wander around uh, the area. This part of Cairo is quite quite safe, um, so we can uh, we can either venture out on our own or perhaps we'll go out as a group. I usually like to go and explore a little bit with those um, who are uh, a little bit more adventurous. Um, we'll have our welcome dinner at the Four Seasons this evening, and then the next day um, will be yet again one of the highlights of our trip as we visit the Pyramids of Giza. Uh, and uh, these need no introduction. Obviously, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, and uh, we'll, our tour today will we'll try to get some explanation to how and why these were built, although the whole topic is still unresolved in the mind of archaeologists. Um, we'll obviously see the pyramids of Giza themselves, as well as the Great Sphinx um, and the Step Pyramid, um, which is a, a, an interesting one. There's, there's so many sites here beyond 
on the pyramids that you know everybody thinks just about that but but some of these other ones are interesting the step period for example was built in the 27th century bc so long before the great pyramids themselves uh and um i think this and and some of the other stops will will really really amaze you and it'll be a uh, a day that we'll um, that we'll um, look back on. Um, <clears throat> you know, the pyramids themselves uh, took thousands and thousands, something like five thousand. Um, you know, permanent laborers were on the site, and as many as twenty thousand people. And even then, with all that manpower, you know, these how did they move these giant blocks of stone uh, to create these perfectly shaped pyramids? This again is is what we're going to be. Um, Finding out about as we as we spend our day in in uh, in Giza. Um, <clears throat> then the next day we will, um, with any luck, um, the plan is to tour the Grand Egyptian Museum, which is now under construction. It's due to be finished at the end of this year, um, and it is going to be one of the most magnificent museums in the world. Um, so we're crossing our fingers that things will. Um, happen on time. Um, the, of course, the, the current Egyptian museum is in the middle of Cairo, um, near Tahrir Square. But this new museum, um, which is uh, five million square feet of space, is going to house, um, among other things, of course, the treasures of Tutankhamun and many, many other. It'll be the most important um, archaeological museum um, in, uh, in in the whole world. Um, they've spent a billion dollars. Uh, to build this thing over the last several years. Uh, so again, I'm hopeful that this is going to happen on time and that we're going to be able to see this um, in all its glory uh, and brand new. And uh, we'll have a final farewell evening uh, at Mena House, which is not far from the pyramids, um, where we'll hopefully get a chance to take in a little bit of the sound and light show um, that is uh, so famous there. Um, <clears throat> And that will um, round out our uh, tour to uh, of Egypt. So for those that uh, opt just for the Egyptian program, we'll be flying uh, out here uh, very early in the morning to catch the connecting flight in Europe back to Canada. Um, and otherwise, for those continuing on with us to, to Israel and or Jordan, we will leave um, after breakfast. It'll be an early breakfast, and we'll take our flight um, from Cairo directly to Tel Aviv. Um, and we'll land there in the afternoon in uh, the, uh, the most major metropolis of Israel. And as it says here, the capital of cool. Tel Aviv is a super exciting, bustling, modern city. Uh, and and it, uh, it's uh, um, one that's, I think, for a lot of people, not terribly well known. I mean, it, it, well known in the sense of, you know, why would you go to Tel Aviv? Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll explore it over the next sort of 24 hours. We'll have time in the afternoon to um, to uh, the afternoon and evening to to enjoy a bit of Tel Aviv on our own. It's known as the city that never sleeps. It's quite got quite a, a nightlife. There's a lot of it's a very young population there, uh, and uh, there's a, there's a, a lot of walking around. A very safe city. Our hotel is located very close to the marina that you can see on the bottom of the picture. So um, we could also head to the beach. Um, um, or maybe visit the Museum of Modern Art or wander through the, the so-called Florentine neighborhood, which is sort of where all the, the hipsters hang out. No shortage of things to do. We'll have a great time um, in Tel Aviv when we arrive in our tour of, of Israel. Officially, we'll start the next day um, when we, uh, we begin in Jaffa. And Jaffa is the port city, and it's where, where Tel Aviv actually uh, originated from, the oldest port in the world. Uh, and it has very narrow streets, um, super picturesque, lots of little um, uh, boutiques and things to visit. Um, they have a great camel market here, which will be a, a great spot to pick up um, some souvenirs. And so Jaffa where we'll, will be where we um, start our tour and we'll have a viewpoint of the modern city of, uh, of Tel Aviv um, from here in Jaffa. Um, so we'll spend some time there before continuing and doing um, a panoramic uh, coach tour around to see the highlights of uh, of Tel Aviv itself, um, and then in the afternoon we'll make the drive up to Jerusalem, which will be our base for the next three days. Uh, and again, as, I, I, as many of you will know from some of my other tours, um, I like very much when we spend more time in one place. Three nights um, is perfect because then we can uh, take in Jerusalem a little bit on our own at our own pace. Um, as well as, of course, um, getting our guided tours of it. 
Jerusalem, well, you know, let's face it, it's always in the news. So um, it, it is uh, a, a very controversial city. It's obviously considered um, to be a holy city by um, both uh, the Islamic faith, um, Judaism, and, and Christianity. Um, and, and that's led to much of the strife that is seen. In fact, the city was completely destroyed um, two times over its um, ex existence, um, uh, which, which dates back thousands and thousands of years. I think 4,000 BC is when they found the first traces of humans here. Um, and, and of course, it's seen um, attacks and conflict um, uh, something like 50 times during its existence. Um, so Jerusalem is a place that, uh, you know, there's, there's so much to it. Um, and, and, and this is why we'll, we'll have a good day here um, to understand a little bit about um, what the city is all about. Um, the, one of the interesting things is that despite being in the middle of the desert, it's actually a very green city. Um, they have a terrific botanical garden. Um, might be something in our leisure time that we'll get a chance to go in, um, and, and check out. Uh, and um, I think another thing that's important to note is, is that, you know, we're here in wintertime. So because it's um, the coolest time of the year, very dry, um, but it can actually snow. It does snow from time to time in Jerusalem. So you know, if you wake up in the morning and see a white blanket on the, on the ground, then you shouldn't be too, too surprised. Um, and uh, it, it also has a very diverse sort of modern culture to it. So besides the history, um, it's known for uh, its artisan community that's there. Um, they have a, a large number of craft breweries and wineries. Um, and it's also a technology hub. In fact, it's been become recognized as one of the technology centers of the world. So, so Jerusalem is a lot more than just the old the old city, the city of David, as it, is, as it was once known. Of course, the city of David is, is, is kind of at the heart of the whole Israeli and Palestine conflict. Um, the city is, is, is split into east and west. Um, and there's, of course, a lot of um, controversy about Israel's um, occupation of, of East Jerusalem. Um, and I'm not going to go into all of that now. You've all read the news and seen what it's all about. But you'll hopefully have a chance to really understand a little bit better um, uh, the perspective from um, from Israel of um, and and hopefully as well the Palestines about uh, about Jerusalem and what has divided it over all these years. We're going to, of course, um, wander into the old city to see the Western Wall, which is the holiest site um, in Judaism. And on the way out, you know, we'll pass Arab um, souks and bazaars. Um, so it's again, it's a whole dichotomy in and of itself. Um, and I'm sure we're going to hear a lot of interesting stories. Um, about uh, about Jerusalem and its um, its its interesting history. The following day, we're going to head out, um, and uh, we uh, are going to the, the the main focus of our day is going to be Bethlehem. Um, you'll have to take our passport with you today. Of course, I'll be reminding you because we cross into Palestine territory, so we have to go through a security checkpoint um, to get to the area around Bethlehem. And we're going to approach it from the south, from the hills, where we'll get an amazing view overlooking. Um, the city itself, the birthplace of Jesus. Um, it goes without saying that we'll visit the Church of the Nativity, um, which is, uh, of course, the place where um, Jesus Christ is born. The church itself run by um, three Christian denominations, so it's looked after by uh, not only the Roman Catholics, but um, the Armenian Orthodox and Greek, Greek Orthodox um, churches are, are all involved in running it and ensuring that it is there for um, Christian pilgrims or anyone interested in um, where um, the whole um, story of Jesus Christ began. Um, if the lineups aren't too long, we'll, we'll try to see there's a star um, in silver that marks the spot where Jesus is alleged to be uh, born. As you can imagine, the lineups to see that are obviously huge, but we'll have a great day exploring um, Bethlehem, the birthplace of Jesus. The following day then, for those uh, that will end the trip um, here in Israel, um, we'll head out early in the morning to head back to uh, Tel Aviv Airport. Um, the rest of us will, will uh, that are continuing on to Jordan will have our, our breakfast before we do a tour over to West Jerusalem. And we'll get a chance to see some of the modern part of the city. Um, and then from there, um, we'll then continue by coach overland to the Allenby Crossing, which is the one of three borders between, uh, between Jordan and Israel. Uh, and so this particular one called Allenby or the King Hussein Bridge uh, is, uh, needless to say, a lot of security in here, but it's no problem. Uh, we will have our passports and we will 
um, cross our, uh, over the border into Amman uh, and then make our way down to, uh, to the capital of Jordan, um, where we will have uh, again an afternoon at leisure. It's a, it's a fascinating city, Amman, one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities uh, in the world. And uh, again, we'll have some, a chance to see a little bit of the city. Um, the, next, uh, the next day, we will, um, uh, we're going to have a bit of a panoramic tour of Amman, and then we're going to head out south or overland towards Petra. And we're going to take the King's Way. So there's a, there's a highway that goes directly to Petra, but um, that is not the exciting uh, way to go. Uh, in fact, the more interesting and scenic uh, way is via this King's Way, which takes us first of all um, to Madaba, uh, which is uh, a, uh, a, a holy site um, where they have the, um, the a mosaic of tiles um, from the sixth century of uh, sixth century. Um, we're going to pass. I think the most scenic part of the trip will be passing through the Wadi Al Mujib, which is a scenic area of deep canyons, yeah, canyons, and it's where the 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 Arnon stream, which is mentioned several times in the Bible, is alleged to have run through this area and flowing out uh, to the Dead Sea. So it's a very scenic drive. Um, we'll we'll gradually do it over the course of the day. So in total, it'll be about four hours of driving, um, arriving into um, Movenpick and uh, to Petra and the Movenpick Resort. Um, by late afternoon, so we'll have a little bit of time uh, to rest up and then enjoy a great um, welcome dinner um, because we'll need all of our energy for Petra itself um, that we'll visit uh, on uh, February the 1st. Um, Petra is the Rose City and, you know, next to the, next to the pyramids and next to, next to visiting uh, Jerusalem, this, this will be undoubtedly one of the highlights on this trip. Um, the Rose City of Petra um, has a, has a, very, very interesting history. They believe that it was built um, back around 300 BC, but it remained undiscovered for centuries. It wasn't until the early 1900s um, that they actually found it again, because you'll see that when we walk in, you go through this narrow gorge that's about a kilometer long um, with these very, very steep um, cliffs that rise up from either side. And then you'll emerge out um, and, and see some of the 800 tombs that exist here, that the, the, the picture here being one of the most famous sites that we'll see in Petra. Um, and uh, and we'll, we'll walk around, or for those that, um, um, it is quite a bit of walking inside Petra, but um, we can also rent camels uh, to take us around um, with a guide. Um, and we'll, we'll get a chance to see some of the 800 tombs that have been uncovered here. But it's important to notice is that actually 85% of Petra is still unexcavated. So there's a tremendous amount that we, that we can't see. Part of it is, um, are, are these, uh, the, these monuments, these buildings that have been carved into the rock and, and part of them have been actually um, constructed. And it's amazing to think that 30,000 people actually lived here and they were able to do it because they built um, a, a water channeling system. Um, it's a very, a very arid part of the, part of the region um, and they managed to channel water from streams um, through the rocks um, that into, these, uh, into all of these buildings um, that enabled 30,000 people to live here. It, you, you won't be surprised to know that um, one of the Indiana Jones was filmed here, uh, films was made here, uh, because uh, it, it just, it, it, it makes you feel like you're, you're, you're stepping back into, into one of those films. So as I say, we'll spend the whole day here. Um, we'll have um, lunch inside. Um, there is quite a bit of walking, but we can uh, arrange um, some assistance from the, the locals with, with camels for those um, that want to do some of the longer walks. One of the walks takes us up um, on top of the hills um, where you get some great views looking down um, over some of these archaeological ruins. So Petra, again, is, is going to be uh, undoubtedly the highlight of our visit to Jordan. I have so many great things to see, but I'm looking forward to, to Petra most of all. Um, the following day, we'll, we'll um, head out of Petra and we'll head back north. Um, and on our way to the Dead Sea, we're going to stop in at the Mayim Hot Springs. Um, and the Mayan hot springs are, are interesting um, because they, um, they emerge out of these rocks um, in this um, Al, uh, Wadi Al Mujib area that I talked about earlier, where we'll, we'll stop and get another vantage point of. Um, and 
uh, these, these waters which end up flowing into the Dead Sea are also very therapeutic and very hot. Um, there's a great five-star resort hotel that we made arrangements for um, to be able to go in. We're going to have lunch there. Um, and for those that wish, we'll, we'll uh, take a sampling of these, these thermal waters that people come from all over the region to visit um, for their therapeutic qualities. By the late afternoon, then, we'll um, arrive at the Dead Sea itself. And uh, again, we've set this up because I think, um, you know, a lot of people come and go in a day, but I think you really, to take in the environment the, uh, of, of the Dead Sea, you need to spend more time. Um, of course, the Dead Sea is, as most people will know, is the lowest point on earth. Um, that's one of its claim to fames. Uh, and uh, of course, the um, ultra salty waters um, that comprise uh, the sea itself. Um, there's only one river flowing in the River Jordan, and there's no water flowing out. So the only way the water leaves is through evaporation. And because of its uh, location in this depressed rift valley, um, the water is, you know, it's almost 10 times as salty as uh, ocean water. And so that's why when you go in, um, you can float um, without any, you can have your hands and feet out of the water and float. You can read a book in the water. It's the most remarkable um, feeling. Um, I'm very much looking forward to floating in the Dead Sea. I've been other sailing lakes, but the Dead Sea, Dead sea is undoubtedly um, one of the most famous of them. Um, and again, because of the, the because of the low, ultra low altitude, you know, the, there's more oxygen in the air. There's less, actually, yet less UV rays because sunlight has to pass through that extra bit of oxygen. Um, and not only the salt, but all of the other minerals in the water are believed to have incredible healing powers, which is why people will come here for a week just to soak in the in the water um, and just to take the the mud from the bottom of the lake and put it all over their bodies. So. I'm just already picturing, picturing some of our members um, covering themselves up with mud um, because uh, it is uh, supposed to give your skin a, a, a great feeling. And of course, they export this mud all over the world and charge a lot of money for it. So while we're there, um, we get to enjoy it and uh, uh, put it on ourselves. So um, as I say, we'll have three full nights here in the Dead Sea. Uh, and uh, one of the days, the following day on the, the 4th of February, we're going to head out to visit Bethany. Um, and Bethany is a quiet place, not too far um, from the shores of the, of the lake and from our resort. Um, and it, it's an important place because it was um, the site where St. John the Baptist uh, was said to have baptized um, Jesus of Nazareth. So it is a, kind of a pilgrimage site for Christians, uh, an important site to visit. Um, and it's quite close to the Jordan River, so it's like a stone's throw from Israel itself, even though you, uh, of course, cannot cross the border here. So it's a, it's a nice little half-day trip that we'll make up here. Um, it's uh, quite a bit of walking around uh, and a very, very sacred site. Uh, and I, I look forward to, to, to enjoying that. Um, we'll have the rest of the afternoon um, at leisure um, uh, and uh, back at our resort on the Dead Sea. So we'll have enough time. Um, to to uh, to in, to to enjoy these amazing waters. In fact, our last full day um, is nothing planned. Um, I can imagine that um, you'll perhaps want to um, book some massages, some other treatments beyond um, just floating in the Dead Sea. Uh, and as I say, I think it's a great a great spot and a great time to just relax and reflect on all of the amazing things that we will have seen over the last couple of weeks on our tour through Egypt, Israel, and Jordan. So, um, and the Crown Plaza Hotel where we're staying is really a wonderful place. Uh, and uh, it's one of the best resorts on the Dead Sea. Uh, and uh, we'll have our farewell dinner there. And then um, that will wrap things up on February the 6th. Um, we'll head back out, heading directly to the airport in Amman, um, where we'll then fly and make our way back, um, make, make our way back to Canada. And so that sums up the day-by-day -day, uh, part of our itinerary. Um, so I'd like to now go through um, a few of the uh, program details uh, and so what this all entails. As I say, we split this into four different variations. Um, you can do simply Egypt only um, at a price of $59.50 per person Canadian. That includes, I'll go through the inclusions in a second. Um, and then you can do either uh, Egypt and Israel or all three countries um, or just Israel and Jordan. So you have a good good selection a good um, uh, idea of um, what you want to do uh, I recommend doing it all 
Um, but I know some of our members have expressed because they've been to one of the other countries that they would rather just do part of it. So that's how we've set it up. Um, in terms of inclusions, um, all of our prices as per normal includes obviously the international airfare based on a Toronto departure. But of course, we can facilitate um, your, uh, your airfare from any place in Canada um, if you're coming from east or west. Uh, and that will be either directly over to Europe or uh, with its stop in Toronto if necessary. The hotels throughout four and five star accommodations. Um, I mean, we have really picked out some, some wonderful, wonderful properties, um, breakfast every day, um, and then usually either lunch or dinner. There's a few days, of course, on the ship where we have three meals a day, but for the most part, I believe that two meals is, is sufficient. So we either have lunch or dinner, depending on the program. Um, and that means that you can then opt um, for, uh, for a lighter meal. Um, of course, all the transportation and, and guiding in with local English speaking guides, and taxes, gratuities, and uh, myself as your host uh, will be there for the entire program. So uh, as usual with most of our programs, pretty much everything is included. The only things that are not um, are the optional side trip to Abu Simbel, which is available for $400, which includes the flight um, and the private guided tour. Um, of course, travel, medical, and cancellation insurance, very, very important, um, and something that we can quote you on depending on your own personal circumstances. Um, airfares from other cities, as I mentioned, and any of the meals um, and beverages that are um, that are not included in the program would be extra, but it's it's uh, not really all that much, as I say. Pretty much includes everything. Um, if you do have any questions, I'm about to uh, have our Q&A section, session, and I see a, a bunch of questions have come in already, and so now would be the time to um, type any questions that you have into that chat box at the bottom. Uh, and... Uh, if, you, if there's any questions that for some reason I can't answer now or that you have subsequent to this webinar, um, you please drop me an email, um, give us a call. We're, we're always happy. We want to make sure that you get all your questions answered. Um, so on that note, uh, I want to go and address some of the questions that have come in um, over the last um, uh, few minutes as we've been going through this webinar. Um, first of all, from, uh, from Shirley, what is, uh, Shirley's asking what the weather is like. Um, well, again, we've chosen this time of the year because a lot of the year in the Middle East is, is simply too hot to enjoy it. Um, in Egypt, we can expect that the temperatures will be probably um, in the mid-20s uh, during the day. Um, a little bit cooler at night, it'll drop down to the teens, so it really makes ideal sleeping weather. You probably won't even need that air conditioning in your room. Um, Israel will be a little bit cooler. It's a little bit further north. Um, when we're in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, we can expect temperatures in the high teens, maybe around... Uh, maybe around 20 uh, in the day. And it could be cool at night. As I said before, you wouldn't be surprised uh, if we got a little, a, a few flakes of snow. Um, but uh, generally very, very comfortable temperatures. Um, in Jordan, again, in the desert, it will definitely be warmer. Um, and we're likely to have temperatures in the, in the low 20s uh, in the Dead Sea area and a bit cooler at night. Um, so overall, it's quite, quite, uh, quite, quite comfortable, a perfect time for touring the region. Um, so question for Joan here, are there any formal nights on board? Um, there's no formal nights per se on the cruise. Everything is quite casual. Um, but given that we're traveling through Islamic countries, that we have to be mindful of their dress codes. So as I say, you don't need to pack a dress, a formal dress or a suit and tie. That is not part of this trip. But you do need to be a little bit mindful um, that it's appropriate, appropriate to wear um, uh, the, the proper sort of dress. Um, you know, you can lounge around in shorts and a t-shirt all day long, um, but when you go for dinner uh, on the ship uh, or in the restaurants and the hotels, they do expect um, smart attire. So um, casual, but, you know, um, I, it's never been a problem with our members. I think everyone knows how, how uh, to, to dress appropriately for the um, types of accommodations that we're in, um, but you don't need to worry about, uh, about any formal attire. Um, and then uh, I have a question here from Peter uh, about visas. Um, so, yes, we do require visas. Um, the Egyptian visa is one that can be procured online, and we'll be sending you the link for that uh, to be able to fill in and apply for that. It's quite, it's quite a simple process. Um, for those that are continuing with us into Jordan, we do need to actually apply for the visa in advance um, because we are crossing from Israel to Jordan via a land border. Um, and so... Uh, as a result of that, um, we, um, 
uh, we have to apply for that visa in advance. But as part of the package of documents that you get, um, we'll send you what that visa application form looks like and a guide on how to fill it out and where to send it and so on. So it's not that big of a deal, but it is, uh, is something that, uh, that has to be done. And Israel, of course, um, does not require us to carry a visa. Um, or at least we're issued the so-called Israeli tourist visa on arrival, but there's uh, there's no pre uh, prerequisites or requirements to be done in advance. Um, and then I have a question here from Mark. Um, what about drinking alcohol? Uh, okay, good question. I mean, we're traveling through Islamic countries where um, the consumption of alcohol is generally frowned upon. That being said, uh, it's not uh, it's not totally taboo. Uh, in either Egypt or Jordan. So alcohol will definitely be available um, in our hotels, in the restaurants that we visit, as well as on board ship. Um, so it's, it's no problem there. Don't expect to find a pub um, out in the middle of Luxor where you can buy beer on the street. That's probably less than likely, um, but you'll have access to it. And similarly in Jordan, um, while the, the locals uh, don't officially imbibe, um, it is, you'll find uh, all of the places that we're staying will, will serve alcohol. So it's um, not a problem. Um, then Jean has asked a question about head coverings for women. Um, to the extent that head coverings are required, and yes, they are required, particularly at um, any mosques that we might visit in uh, Jordan um, or um, uh, perhaps some of the temples. The temples, not so much. Um, but to the extent that head coverings are required, and I, I always say they, they generally always provide them at the entrance, um, but I think it's great if you have a, a, a scarf or, or something that you would feel more comfortable with. A lot of people don't obviously like to put you know, public stuff on their heads. I respect that. So it's a good idea to carry, um, to carry something to, to cover your head. And for women as well, be cognizant to, to have things to cover your shoulders and cover your knees. Um, at, at many of the sites. So um, we'll give you a bit of a, a list of, of things we recommend to take with you uh, to take into account the temperature as well as um, what's, um, what's appropriate uh, where. Um, good, so I think that's all the questions that have been asked so far. Um, but of course, as I said, if you have any other questions at all, um, please do contact us. Um, by email, by phone. We're always thrilled to hear from you. I hope you find it, found it an informative webinar and hope you'll consider joining us um, on our trip to Egypt, Israel, and Jordan uh, in January of 2020. Um, it's about, um, um, I think we've got about half of um, the space um, booked out already. Um, so that's great news. And uh, I'm quite sure that, uh, uh, I'm quite sure that we'll be able to accommodate anybody, but I do suggest um, booking fairly soon. So on that note, thank you so much for your participation, particularly those who got up early on the West Coast. I appreciate that immensely. And uh, I look forward to catching you at all in an upcoming event. I'll be out West over the next couple of weeks. Um, so we'll, we'll see you there and have yourselves a great day.